to talk about the aestheticizing of the northern landscape, I thought I'd begin with this rather nice installation at the Art Gallery of Ontario with the Lauren Harris from 1914 in the middle and flanked on uh, both sides by two paintings by the French painter Pierre Bonnard, the one on the left way over there, on the mid, also from the mid-teens, and the one on the right from 19. Uh, 33. But let's focus on these two, which, as I said, are more or less uh, contemporary. And the Bonar, insofar as you can make it out, you can see is a uh, luxurious kind of picture, semi-tropical foliage, Mediterranean light, overall color patterns that pull the, you can see the children in the foreground, uh, and the landscape into a single decorative unity. So the fact that Harris sits quite comfortably in this context is a reminder, certainly, as we've also referred to this morning, that he and his colleagues knew uh, quite a lot about contemporary modernist developments in France and in Europe. But I also see the paintings as being, I see the differences as being as important as the affinities. The Harris is decorative too, but in a, I would say, more self-conscious way, and forgive my iPad photograph of it. Uh, there's the triptych division. Then there are the, there's the symmetrical placement of the birch tree on the left and the conifer on the right. These two emblematic uh, northern trees standing like attendant saints paying witness to the central Georgian Bay landscape. I don't think we'd call this painting hedonistic. Uh, more, it's more severe and uh, more devotional, one might say. And at first glance, too, with the foreground, if you look at the foreground, seems in a traditional kind of way to allow us to step into it, walk into it inwards and onwards. But then when you look again and look a little more closely, it stays paint. It, the foreground really stays like layers of paint, literal paint, a kind of almost wall of paint that doesn't allow us, that is not to be stepped on. It's there more to be seen, more like a barrier which really precludes anything but imaginative entry into the more illusionistic resolved landscape that lays way beyond. Uh, Edward Monk often treats the foregrounds of his landscapes in this kind of impassable way, but maybe uh, this photograph here on the right uh, provides a more uh, visual analogy. It popped up serendipitously when I was searching for Bonar images on the web, and here comes the Bonar Glacier from Switzerland. Uh, but it's a useful photograph because we are looking across the snowbound foreground of the advancing glacier, which is haphazardly strewn with dark and rocky debris. It's a foreground that is like Harris. It's steep and rugged, and that defiantly separates us from the majesty of the mountains far off. So Bonar's southern holistic hedonism, set in a kind of here and now, contrasted against Harris's northern austerity, which somehow frustrates the viewer, because who or whose reward is deferred to somewhere over there, uh, to something other, really only to be yearned for. And the contrast, at least to me, seems emblematic of the differences that set apart northern, northern attitudes to landscape from those of Europe further south. And as we shall see, northern symbolist landscape painting, as I call it, as it emerged in North America in the 1890s and later in Canada, as we've discussed earlier today, sought its own kind of content and with it, its own decorative and formal structuring of the landscape. And of course, that was one of the, whoops, that was one of the central themes of my 1984 exhibition at the Art Gallery of Ontario, entitled The Mystic North. And the story was at least partially retold in the exhibition Luminous Modernism, Scandinavian Art Comes to America in 1912, organized by the American Scandinavian Society in New York this past spring to celebrate the centennial of the of the uh, Scandinavian exhibition, and there, of course, is the catalog, uh, the exhibition which, as we rehearsed already this morning when it's shown in Buffalo, provided a pivotal experience for especially MacDonald and Harris, so much so that when they came home from their visit, they would proclaim, and we can almost all cite it out aloud, that what they had seen were true souvenirs of the mystic north around which we all revolve, and this, of course, these were the models that we must use for Canada. 
Now, the Scandinavian art exhibition included some 160 works, uh, but despite the Art Nouveau design of the catalog, these works ranged from realism, born in the 1880s, to the newest generation of work influenced by Matisse and Cubism. But MacDonald and Harris, as we know, looked very selectively and saw, or shall we say could use, only artists from the in-between generation, usually referred to as the National Romantic Generation, the one that came into its own in the early 1890s, and of course, as we've also already mentioned this morning, uh, it was particularly the sweet Gustav Fierstadt, Norwegian Harald Solberg. Now, I think uh, Katharina also mentioned Anna Bober, and in fact, in the Luminous in the uh, Luminous Modernism exhibition, there was a kind of perfect Bobert that would have, uh, uh, that in many ways seemed to predict a number of group of seven landscapes. In any case, we of course have long dismissed the notion that the, the group was not dependent on European styles and quite accept that their work, however stylistic, innovative, and independent it is in its own ways, was also part of a bigger story. Uh, their paintings were in fact quite contaminated by foreign influences, and we've rehearsed them again this morning, post-impressionism, Art Nouveau, even Fauvism. But it was quite specifically the Scandinavians who saw new formal ways, and that's what I'm stressing today, new formal ways to compose the landscape in a way that pointed to something, shall we say, more truthful, a more truthful vision, a more cultural cap capturing of the sense of place as they saw it of the Canadian North. And these formal compositions concomitantly also served to overturn uh, the more traditional pictorial relations as they prevailed, still prevail between viewer and pictorial space. So let's just quickly look at a few comparisons to remind us of the family relations between the Scandinavians of the 90s and the Canadians after 1912. Uh, there was the Peel of Fiestad, his heavy animal rhythms, as we see on the left, and his pointless paint application. And of course, the affinity of subject matter like their shared predilection, not just for snow, but for sunsets and twilight and moonlight. The times of day important because that was when nature's details dissolved into larger, simpler forms, or when, as it were, the landscape abstracted itself. For Harris, a lasting influence was, of course, this uh, vision of northern, cold northern mountain peaks by Solbert with its geometric reproductions and cold color schemes. Solbert showed Harris how to levitate subject matter from mere visual fact into the realm of mystical idea. But there were other affinities at play. Helma Oslund on the top, of course, was not in the Buffalo Show. Uh, and Frank Carmichael, in any case, didn't see the Buffalo Show, but both impose on autumn landscapes, similar tapestry-like patterns, uh, flattering their subject matter decoratively into a kind of Art Nouveau uh, Art Nouveau design. And this comparison allows us to introduce the Finnish painter actually Galen Kalala, who was a member of a circle of nationally motivated artists that gathered round Jan Sibelius, the composer whom, of course, Wyndham Lewis called, and Glenn Gould both called uh, a Canadian composer, a composer of the Canadian bush. But what was, of course, at issue or what was no longer at issue, was descriptive realism, but crossing over a threshold from descriptive realism to something higher and more intense, something more subjective, transcendental maybe, to make an effect pictures that were landscapes of the soul, whether that was a national soul or an individual soul or both of them simultaneously. To achieve this, as I've suggested, required a significant rethinking of pictorial space, such as it then prevailed throughout the 19th century, whether in romantic, realist, Barbizon, Hague School, or impressionist landscapes. The problem shared on both sides of the Atlantic went something like this. When the Scandinavians, often inspired by a new sense of nationalism and in search for accompanying elevated transcendental subject matter, came back north at the end of the 1880s, they discovered that their impressionist techniques are the ones they had studied in France, working in the softer and light and atmosphere around Paris, didn't work when they got home. Something was wrong if you tried to paint the north and it still ended up looking like France. The light in the north was just too harsh, the wilderness too chaotic, uh, for eyes that had been trained in southern cultivated landscapes. 
the Scandinavian artists supplying what they could use from the from newer post-impressionist models devised in all their respective ways. Uh, a common set of stylistic structures with which they could unlock their own landscape, allowing them to see it more boldly and, again, from their perspective, more truthful or, to see, uh, or in its proper spirit. And that, of course, as we've said, is what the Canadians picked up in Buffalo, that the Scandinavians could offer them decorative keys to uh, to discover fresh visions of their own northern nature at a moment when they realized that their English, French, Dutch, or whatever models that they had at hand were no longer do. An important problem was that the older working models dealt with a landscape long since conquered and cultivated, whereas the landscape in the north has yet to bend itself to man's will. And maybe it was too big, too strange, too powerful ever to be controlled. And northern painting had to learn to respect wildernesses, wilderness nature's otherness, so to speak. Accordingly, the painters also had to learn how to problematize viewers' working, working relations to pictorial space, had to coax their eyes and indeed their bodies into new positions and viewpoints. In the process, national uh, northern symbolist landscape painting largely obliterated middle ground Unlike, say, and we have them there, a Barbizon Rousseau or an Impressionist Kaibot, rarely does a northern symbolist landscape composition allow us to wander in uh, through the picture, stepping into the foreground, sauntering into the middle, and finding a comfortable place in there to sit down and have a picnic. Uh, we can demonstrate it in this way. Uh, Gustave Doré on the left in this painting, it's undated, but it's probably from the 1870s, uses a standard romantic device to ameliorate the terrace of the forest. He opens up the foreground and drives a continuous broad path down the middle of the picture until he releases us into the sunlit plains far beyond. Prince Eugene on the right takes another tack. It's as if when we have walked down the open road, our destination in view ahead, he decides that that's not where he wants us to go, and instead he makes us turn 90 degrees to face the forest wall itself and all its confused and impenetrable maze, uncultivated, deep, mysterious, dark. So a compositional no mode of northern landscape painting here is to block access by the dense, mysterious mass of the forest. Mass of the forest. Another variation of this is to draw a screen of trees across the picture plane as a compositional barrier to define a threshold between spaces that are discontinuous both physically and psychologically. Yeah, look at these. There's no point of entry here, no foreground path, no continuous transition from foreground to middle ground to the most distant ground. If there's a foreground, it's confused and precariously steep and slippery, and even if we try to scramble up it, who knows what's over the edge. It's unknown and potentially dangerous. In effect, the tree screen divides the picture into two distinct spatial disconnected parts. One is compacted, physically tangible, a foreground, barrier placed claustrophobically close up, and the other a distant panoramic macrocosm for imaginative exploration. And we can find the theme through various iterations. And there's, of course, no way that Thompson could have known the Galen Kalala, even in reproduction, but he may have known this Solbert on the left that Harris saw at the Scandinavian exhibition in Buffalo, another compositional type that he would use many times, and I think the comparison is self-explanatory. And here's another variation of how Solbert pulled, how Solbert pulls to the sides the foreground screen of gnarled and twist, twisted black trees like an opening of a stage curtain to reveal the dazzling moonlit vision beyond. Harris has adapted Sobel's basic structure in Above Lake Superior, and like it contrasts foreground detail to distant, abstracted, and monumentalized forms, reconfirming the compositional disconnect between foreground and background. And just to prove that I'm not making any of this up, here is uh, Solbert's own description of his compositional arrangement in this painting as he writes, what I sought, what I sought was precisely 
the opposition between the calm and grandeur and the power of the mountains and the broken nature of the foreground plain strewn with twisted pieces of dead wood amongst which rise a few solitary tree trunks as a physical barrier, as a physical barrier, far beyond these lofty architectural forms rise austerely and peacefully as symbols of transcendent experience. So lots of tree screens standing between the a distant standing between foreground and a distant beyond leaps from the near to the far. And other ways of composing could be derived from pulling apart the near and the far. And just very quickly, you could, on the top, look up towards the mountaintops, denying the viewer a place to stand as well as peripheral reference points. Or you could burrow downwards into the jumble of tree stumps or rocks or streams, uh, granting these intimate fragments uh, their own monumental stature. So what the Canadians discovered in the Scandinavian pictures uh, that they saw in Buffalo were new northern European models for the landscape. For, for landscape painting, ones that could liberate them from the convention they had been trained in. These conventions had, after all, been shaped by or mediated by, can we say, painting cultures that had largely been nurtured in a European pastoral tradition. And they failed the task of giving voice to the spirit of the northern landscape, as, and they failed to give task, uh, the task of giving voice as the group themselves experienced it. The old conventions were not true to what they directly saw and felt. On some level, the group no doubt at least half believed, as the myth went, that if they needed new artistic techniques, they could develop them innately out of their deep love of country. Ironic or ironically, of course, the way to set free the northern landscape from old conventions, the way to capture the North, northern nature's true spirit was, as we have seen, to perform still another operation of mediation by culture, replacing the old conventions by more modern uh, modern aestheticizing ones, or more, uh, more modern aestheticizing of the landscape. Of course, remarkably, this aestheticizing still seems to hold true a century later. After all, Algonquin Park or the Rockies uh, didn't look like this in 1912, and maybe it still doesn't look like that in 2012, but however that may be, this is how we see it how the group of seven has taught us to frame and organize it. Inevitably, do we not still aestheticize the Canadian northern landscape in these images? But other essential questions devolve from these pictorial formalities, especially the question of why northern symbolist landscape painting, both European and Canadian, are largely unpeopled. This depeopling, as it were, of the landscape, as you know, has aroused a number of approbations, the most extreme of which have charged the group with racial genocide. But if racial peoples are excluded from the paintings, the paintings also tell, that was too quick, where did that go? Anyway, the paintings also tell other lies. Where's the industry and technology well underway that helped uh, make the North accessible for them? Where's the railway uh, that brought them there? The railway siding and the boxcar that they lived in are somewhere behind us, well out of sight. So maybe the paintings are not, do not address, address not practical, but spiritual transport. To have depicted native people or other human activities would have introduced another distracting narrative or other distracting narratives and focused attention in directions more specific and history bound, diluting the spiritual and universal quests that they perhaps were after. So let us quickly look at this. Even when physical entry seems afforded, as in this Hodler's painting from 1892 or the Harris landscape with which we began, somehow it isn't. No sauntering here. Uh, before we even step onto the road, it's down the center perspective. Perspectival recession rushes us off past the falling autumn leaves towards the near infinity of the setting sun, all of it weighty with symbol symbolic meaning. So where do we stand as viewers? Where are we? It used to be that when artists wanted to pull us into the embrace of transcendent, transcendent experience, they did so via a surrogate figure set inside the depicted landscape, a monk on the seashore, men gazing at the moon, 
of woman staring at the sunset, as in the paintings of Caspar David Friedrich from the beginning of the 19th century, and of course, there she is. But in Hodler, uh, where is she? Has she gone? Well, if we look closely, we can probably, where are we? Well, you probably still spot her, can probably still spot her somewhere in there. And indeed, if we look at Hodler's pencil sketch for the painting there, she still is. But then he took her out, or rather he made her step back, back out of the picture, back, back right into our own shoes with the consequences that our vision of the transcendent is no longer mediated but direct. He peopled these northern paintings, strive to evoke a direct and individual, unmediated relation to the revelations, I almost said scripture, but to the revelations of virgin nature as a pathway to spiritual experience. Agnostic or aesthetic, as most of the Scandinavians were, or theosophical, as Harris was, they were also nevertheless cultural Protestants for whom, uh, for whom access to the spiritual was a singular and lonesome quest. And what an anxious quest it was in these pictures. It's gold somehow in sight at the same time as pictorially it lies always at an unattainable distance. Now as a closing question, is this depeopling and this withdrawal into an imaginary spiritual world simply a rejection of progress and modernity? And perhaps it is, if the spiritual quest is an anti-modern quest. But let us not forget that some of the northern symbolist landscape painters, with some of the northern symbolist landscape painters who had been systematically abstracting the landscape eventually found their work evolving into pure mystical abstraction. Thank you.